Next section we're going to talk about is the farmers versus the railroads and demand for cheap money. Okay, cheap money. That sounds weird, doesn't it? All right. So uh, MC8 farmers demands. Okay, farmers were trapped in a vicious cycle. Crop prices fell and railroad monopolies increased shipping rates, which reduced farmers profits. Okay. All right. So let's go over these quick. <coughs> farmers are having an abundance of technology, right? all these tractors and combines and all this new stuff it's making it easier than ever to produce crops faster than ever with less people so that means what's going to happen to the prices well the prices of crops go way down because we're making a whole lot more of them uh, well as that's going on the railroad monopolies are actually creeping up their shipping rates so they're making more cargo than ever getting less money for than ever for it and the railroad shipping rates are going up and up and up, partially due because the railroads had a complete monopoly and you couldn't choose which railroad you used unless you had multiple railroads running through your town. So maybe if you're a farmer that's around Chicago, you were okay, but if you're one from the South that only had two working railroad lines, you were pretty much at the mercy of the railroads. Farmers, uh, excuse me, farms were mortgaged to buy more land, to plant more crops, to make more money. Now, this is it where the farmers messed up, okay? So they already weren't making money. So they took a loan out on the farm to buy more land, to plant more crops. And guess what happened to the crop prices? They fell down again, because now there's more crops than ever. So increased supply caused uh, crop prices to fall and banks took the farms so this was the vicious cycle that farmers were in and they were losing their houses they were losing their their farm the u.s economy went through a series of a, a time of deflation where money decreased the money supply decreased creating tight money now tight money means there's less money in circulation which means that the money is worth more okay so they're taking out loans, the farmers are, and whenever they go to pay it back, let's say they take out a $10,000 loan, right? When they go to pay, to, to pay it back, decre uh, deflation has occurred, and now instead of paying back 10000 that $10,000 is worth more like 15000 So it's squeezing farmers from every possible angle here. All right, so let's see the next one. Tight or hard money is good for consumers, and banks, good for people that own stuff. Uh, money was worth more, or money is worth more, consumers got more for their money. That's hard or tight money, that's deflation. Now let's talk about the other one. Well, not yet. Hard money hurt farmers who paid more interest to borrow, yeah, you already covered that, okay. So the next thing, all right, the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. So, farmers hated deflation. Deflation picks their pocket. So if that picks their pocket, if that's going to make them lose money and value in their farm, they want the opposite. They want inflation, rapid inflation. Because if I borrow $10,000 and the money inflates, let's say three times as much, then it's, when I go to pay it back, it's like paying $3,000 back. Because the money is easier to get and it's flowing like a river throughout America. So the Sherman Silver Purchase Act is passed. Farmers want to lose their soft money, getting 16 silver pieces equal to one piece of gold. They wanted bimetallism or loose money. Okay, back at this time, before the Sherman Silver Purchase Act, we were on the gold standard. Okay, so the gold standard said for every dollar's worth of gold, you can actually print one paper dollar. And anybody at any time could walk in a bank with their paper money and say, give me my gold. Okay. Well, the farmers say, well, let, we got this big pile of silver that we've been building up out west. Silver, I mean, mountains of silver out there. Why not print all the money based on silver and gold? So now instead of this little pile of gold, we have this huge mountain of metal that we can base the value of our currency on. And we could triple the amount of money in circulation, which makes it easier for everybody to pay off debts. But... It also makes all money worth three times less. So the bankers and the robber barons are gonna hate the Sherman Silver Purchase Act because they actually have money. Today, our inflation is out of control. 
Uh, just this year, we lost about 10% to inflation, 10% of the value of our money. Since the year 2000, we've lost about 40%. Okay, so your dollar is worth 40% less than it used to be worth in the year 2000. Uh, I had a professor, his name is Claude Oub, whenever he was teaching in the 70s, he was a high school teacher. He was actually an American history teacher. He taught my parents. He was making $3,000 a year in the 1960s and saving money because everything cost a lot less back then because money was worth a lot more back then. And now teachers make about $40,000 a year and struggle to get by on that, okay? All right, so next thing, uh, problems with railroads and banks, okay? Help from the National Grange. Okay, so out on the Great Plains, one of the big problems that the farmers have is that uh, it's isolation. Your nearest neighbor's 10 miles away, okay? So let's say you have a couple and they have three sons, right? How are those three sons going to meet friends? How are they going to meet their future mates? If, they, if everybody lives 10 miles away, this is going to be a very weird social circle. So what they started doing is the farmers on the Great Plains say, hey, once a month, let's get together in a central location at someone's house and we'll have a social, okay? We'll have a, a big meeting. Everybody's gonna bring some beer and some food and whatever, and everybody's going to talk. Well, it's kind of like the 18 ver 1800s versions of uh, FarmersOnly.com. Okay, without the internet. So, but anyway, now once they got there, they probably talked about uh, farmer stuff, if I had to guess, because they're all farmers, right? So how long do you think it was during the first meeting of the grains before one farmer turned to the other one and said, hey man, those railroad rates suck, you know? Well, then the other one says, well, what can we do about it, right? And he said, that's a good question. What can we do about it? So they turned the Grange from a social club into a political action group, okay? So a political action group basically is going to uh, run candidates and stuff like that for office, and they're gonna try to get more political power. So it's a political union, kind of. The Grange created a uh, farm cooperatives to pool their resources, okay? So the root word of cooperative by the way, today we just call them co-ops. You've probably heard of them before. These are the farmer stores in town. Uh, uh, the root word of cooperative is cooperate. So the farmers are cooperating with each other in order to get lower prices. So number one, uh, they got to store grain cheaply, okay? So instead of renting grain silos from the railroads, they built their own, okay? Pool money for purchases. Well. One farmer might not have needed a tractor if he had 40 acres. What if 10 farmers that had 40 acres got together and bought a tractor and they had one huge field in the middle of their houses and they all worked it together? Well, that's a cooperative. They are cooperating with each other, okay? Uh, so they would pool money for big purchases like that. And they would also buy tools wholesale. So what wholesale means is if you buy a bunch, you get a discount, okay? So every farmer needs, you know, let's say um, a hammer, right? Every farmer needs a plow. Every farmer needs harnesses, you know? So if everyone needed a hammer, let's go with the hammer metaphor, right? So let's say a hammer costs five bucks, all right? Well, if we bought a thousand hammers, maybe Sears and Roebuck will send it to us for three bucks a piece. And we could pass those savings on to all the farmers in the Grange, in the cooperative. However, if you just buy one, you're kind of wasting the two bucks, right? So that, that's what's going on here. Another group called the Farmers Alliance was not actually made up of farmers. They were people in the cities that were sympathetic to the farmers, okay? So uh, these were preachers, these were newspaper people, teachers, and they said basically farmers are the backbone of our entire society, and without farmers, our cities are gonna fall apart. So we need to support the farmers. And they create their own alliance. So the Grange and the Farmers Alliance are eventually gonna merge together with certain elements of the Democratic Party and create something called the Populist Party. So, if you look right here, 
These are examples of grain silos. You probably have seen these before. They're in Crowley. They're still there today. Okay. So um, Crowley was the rice capital of the world. Y'all know that. Okay. We made a bunch of rice. These are rice dryers. And Rain, which is the next city over, also made a lot of crops too. Well, the railroad was coming through the south, and they were determining where to put the railroad. Because the cool thing is, any city that the railroad touches turns to gold. Like, everybody floods there. It's, it's kind of like the interstate. All the big cities are next to the interstate, right? Or maybe did they put all the interstates n through the big cities? Well, anyway, they feed off of each other. They help each other to grow. So <coughs> the people of Crowley, they go to the, the main guy that's building the railroad through Louisiana, and they say, sir, we would like you to build your city through our, excuse me, your railroad through our city. And he says, well, what are you going to do for me? Because I know that's going to boost your city up, you know. It's going to help you get all the crops out. And they said, we're going to name the city after you, Mr. Crowley. They said, all right, that sounds okay, but it's not enough. And he said, what do you mean? Well, he said, my right-hand man, my second in charge, his name is Rain. His last name is Rain. So if you could work out a deal with the city down the road and get them to name theirs Rain, then we'll put this, the railroad through both of your towns. Now, at the time, Rain was actually named Poopyville. Okay? Uh, and I'm glad they changed their name. It sounds a lot better than Poopyville. Okay? So, <clears throat> all right. So the Grange uh, versus railroads, okay? Railroad monopolies hurt farmers by misuse of government land grants. Y'all remember the, the first chapter we said that uh, when they were building the railroads, they gave a subsidy. Y'all remember that? When the government gives you something in order for you to do something, they gave a subsidy to the railroad companies where they would give them a mile of land on each side of the track, right? For every, every little bit they built. Well, what they were doing is they were holding all that land. They weren't selling it to the settlers like the U.S. government told them to. See, the government thought they would sell it for cheap to farmers, and then that would boost the railroads. Well, 85% of that land remained unsold, and they just held it and held it. And as more people moved to America, that land got more and more valuable. At one time, y'all, you could buy an acre of land out west for 25 cents. Okay? Now, try that. It's not going to work. Um... Uh, just for another example, okay, back in 1910, my great-grandfather went to Resharf, and he bought the land that I live on now, and my field was bought, I have 10 acres in the field, my field was bought for $20 an acre, okay, when I bought the house, I had to pay over $3,000 an acre, so land really does go up in value because God's not making much more of it, so buy land if you want to invest in something the long haul all right cheaper shipping prices for robber barons oh okay so one of these guys was john d rockefeller rockefeller made a deal with cornelius vanderbilt that he would get 40 percent off of the price of shipping it was a secret railroad rebate so he paid full price out in public rockefeller did to vanderbilt and then vanderbilt would secretly ship him 40 percent back under the table so that way none of Vanderbilt's other customers would get jealous. But that really, really, Vanderbilt was making the money by upcharging the other customers, okay? So, plus Rockefeller was shipping a whole lot of uh, oil. So, all right, next section right here, farmer's demands, okay? Farmers get pro-farmer Granger laws, okay? They call them Granger laws because the Grange, this, this political party, basically political action group starts to push for pro farmer laws okay anything that's good for farmers is called a granger law you need to remember that okay and they wanted to regulate railroads and warehouse rates they wanted the government to step in and say you know what these rates are too high you can't charge that much you can't give secret rebates and all that stuff so eventually congress passed the interstate commerce act y'all need to put a star next to this one underline it put shooting rainbows and unicorns whatever okay this one's on the leap test it always is so uh the interstate commerce act now let's break that down the word commerce means trade 
interstate means between states. Okay, so if you look at it, it is the Trading Between States Act. Okay, so it was passed because of public outcry against railroad shipping rates and price discrimination, which is those rebates. It banned special rebates, so Rockefeller can't get his secret rebate anymore. Uh, special deals to shippers to cut select costs. It requires that rates be proportional to distance. So the farther you go, the more it should cost, right? I mean, that just makes sense. Uh, a two-mile journey should not cost as much as a 200-mile journey. But the railroads were doing that to people, okay? They were saying, well, we still got to load and unload the cargo, so you're going to pay the whole thing. Price rates must be public and open to inspection by the government. So this one's important, you know. Uh, your prices must be posted. In other words, before this happened, before the Interstate Commerce Act, uh, you would go in and let's say you're a farmer. You got 10,000 tons of rice to ship. That's a lot of rice, okay? You would walk into Crowley and say, I've got 10,000 tons to ship. How much is it going to cost me? And the guy, the clerk behind the, the counter, would sit there with a little pen and paper. He'd go ask the boss, and he'd come back with some made-up number. And the next guy that comes in, well, let's say it's his buddy. Well, he'd give him half the price off, you know? Well, what he did is he jacked the price up on you so he can give his buddy a discount. So he said, all these rates must be posted. So that way the farmer himself could actually go up and calculate the shipping costs. Now, one thing that still works today, this is still important to you today, okay? The Interstate Commerce Act established an important precedent that when it comes to interstate trade, if, if this trade goes between states, it says the government, the federal government, has the right to regulate and maybe even tax it. However, if it doesn't leave the state, if it's between Mamu and Church Point trading, right? That is not interstate commerce, that's intrastate commerce, and the state government is the only one with the authority to actually regulate that. Y'all, this does so much for us uh, in today's modern society, because right now, let's say you go and buy, I don't know, a computer, okay? and you go to uh, Best Buy, you're gonna pay taxes on that computer, right? Well, if you pick a company, like let's say Dell, the computer company, didn't have a brick and mortar store in Louisiana. So there's no brick and mortar store. You can't go buy a Dell in a store in Louisiana. Well, then you could call Dell on the phone and you could order a computer and they could ship it to you through the mail and you wouldn't have to pay taxes. And that's all worked out in the Interstate Commerce Act, okay, and with a lot of other things as well. All right, that's it for this section right here.